Good morning. My name is Jennifer Ryan, and on behalf of the Alliance of Women in Workers' Compensation, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today is titled, Measuring Performance of a Workers' Compensation Program will last approximately one hour and is a live interactive webinar being broadcasted today, Thursday, October 28, 2021. Before we get started, I would like to thank our 2021 corporate sponsors for their support on hosting events such as this. They support us not because they want their logos up on a screen, but they support the cause, which is to affect positive change in the workers' compensation industry through networking, support, mentoring, and collaboration. The Alliance is inclusive of all professionals in workers' compensation, regardless of career stage, with the belief that we can all learn from and support each other. Please be sure to the head to the AWWC website for all upcoming virtual and in-person events. Our theme this year has been Through the Lens, which has allowed us to take different topics each month and focus on specific conversations that will bring value to our followers. To round out this year, we will have the Happiness Effect event in December at the WCI conference. Don't forget to register for this in-person event at the AWWC website. If you aren't attending this conference, don't worry, we will be recording this event and hosting a pre-recorded webinar for our followers. Stay tuned in the coming weeks as we announce our 2022 theme and event schedules. I'm also excited to share with you today that the 2022, the AWWC will be hosting a book club throughout the year. Love reading books? We'll be releasing more information on this in the coming weeks. We have some great content in store for everyone next year, so continue to watch for communication coming out soon. The Alliance is hiring. Do you or someone you know have experience in marketing and are interested in working with the Alliance? We are currently looking for a senior program coordinator. Learn more about the position on our LinkedIn page. Resumes can be sent to careers at allianceofwomen.org. Today we join Kimberly George, AWWC Board Vice President, along with two industry experts as we complete our four-part educational series. How do employers measure the success of their workers' compensation program, understand their lost costs and cost of risk? Our guests are data-driven leaders, focus on understanding their organization's data and trends. They focus on driving quarter over quarter, year over year program improvements while actively engaging to create solutions to directly address opportunities. Learn their tricks and tips around meaningful goals, creating a culture of continuous improvements and measuring. During this interactive webinar, you will have the opportunity to interact with Kimberly and the panelists through the Zoom chat feature seen on your screen. Please feel free to ask questions or add comments, and we will be sure to try and answer as many questions as time permits. Thank you for the time you're spending with us today, and we hope you enjoy this webinar. Okay, we'll get our videos up and get started. Thanks, Jennifer, for that wonderful introduction. All right, welcome. I'm so thrilled to have the two of you with me today and the opportunity to continue um, this series, which has really been designed to help our followers at the Alliance better understand really program design and what employers and their partners um, are striving for to deliver an exceptional workers' compensation program. So I'll dig into a little bit about the session today. But let's first start with introductions. And um, Michelle and Susan, if Michelle go first, but if both of you would not only um, describe your role, a little bit of your background too, so that our, our attendees today have a better idea of who you are. Sure, happy to. Um, I am Michelle Ryan. I am Vice President of Partnership Services uh, for ESIS. Um, I have been in the insurance industry for 30 years um, in a lot of different facets of it. I've uh, worked with carriers, with um, uh, agencies, uh, certainly with TPAs at the moment. And uh, our goal is to work as closely as possible with our clients uh, and with our carrier partners 
uh, to make sure that we're providing the right information to them that helps their programs move forward. Great. Michelle is also an ambassador for the Alliance um, out of Arizona. And you'll see Michelle at a lot of Alliance events around the country as we open up in 2022. So thanks for your support of the Alliance. And, and Susan, you've been a past Alliance speaker and a, a great supporter of the Alliance. Um, and we thank you for that. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Shemansky, and I'm the Vice President of Risk Management at ADECO Group. And like Michelle, I've been in the industry for 30 years, and I've worked at carriers, TPAs, and on the employer side. And at ADECO, I'm responsible for buying the insurance, the safety, the claims, and we really believe in measuring everything because we feel like if we have robust data, we're going to have robust results. So look yeah. at this topic. So ADECO is such an interesting company, Susan, and I anticipate many of our followers, unless they were to Google it, might not know ADECO. So will you just tell us a little bit about your company and the uniqueness that ADECO is? Sure. ADECO is um, a temporary staffing company, and we are a global company, a huge global company, um, 20 billion um, globally and close to 3 billion in the United States. And we staff everything from light industrial to to medical professionals, engineering, so a little bit of everything. And we go under several different names. Um, so we have a talent solutions group that is more focused on professional um, modus, which is IT, and then a deco who's really focused on the light industrial. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It also, and you'll hear, I think our audience will hear from Susan, um, some of the uniqueness that that um, model that ADECO has with their employees and their, their, their uh, companies, um, temporary employees, I guess I should say. So wonderful. Thank you so much for that extra information. So before we get started, I just want to refresh our memories on the last three sessions in this series. You may remember that Janine Crawl and Andrea Schofer and Carol Murphy were our first guests. And what they did was they talked about how a workers' compensation program is designed from the underwriter perspective, the broker, and Janine representing an employer. And we talked then about the culture of the company and what they wanted to achieve with their goals, not just the risk manager, but the company's culture. How do they um, engage with business partners? How do they handle their employees? And really looking at that culture that then needed to be transposed into and delivered as part of the workers' compensation program. And we talked about risk tolerance um, that an organization needed needs to address as well. And then we went and we had claims managers talk about once the structure of the program was designed, how are claims designed? And so we, we heard from a smaller employer talk about their bundled program, where it's with an insurer, managed care, claims, all bundled together in a nice package with a bow. And, and that risk manager didn't make a lot of the decisions on their program, although very savvy about the results. And we learned about, so that was a carrier model. We learned about a TPA model um, and then also self-administration and, and why employers choose these different models. And then we learned about service providers and there's so many service providers from managed care to investigations, legal. Um, and I know a lot of our followers here at the Alliance really appreciated that because they didn't have insight into some of the complexities around the claim, but also the number of people and entities supporting um, the employer's program or the carrier's program. And so now today, we're bringing it all full circle to say, we've designed the program, we have our claims model, the partners have been identified, 
um, from a service provider perspective. And now how are we measuring the results? And um, you, you see Susan and Michelle and heard their backgrounds. They are the perfect partners um, for us today to be able to hear from as they deal with the data and program outcomes all day long. So thank you for that. Um, if you missed any of those past webinars, they're all available on demand um, on our Alliance of Women.org website. So feel free to go out, um, share those with your colleagues and others who might benefit. But let's get started. And Susan, I'll, I'll get started with you. If you want to do a little bit of explanation on how a DECO's program is set up, and then how do you begin to um, establish what you're going to measure? Um, how do you know what to measure? And then um, you may share some of what you're doing today, but it may also apply to some of what you've done in the past. Sure. So um, ADECO has a very large self-insured retention for our workers' comp program. So while a lot of employers focus on insurance costs, we're really focused on that total cost of risk. We're taking on most of the claim cost ourselves. It's rare if we ever really tap into insurance, but I think the things we measure are probably very similar to an insurance program as well. And our two main things that we focus on is frequency and severity. So um, frequency, I would say, really ties into our culture. We want to make sure that our associates go home every day safely. Everything that we do is looking at where are they being injured. So we're looking at the client that they're at when they're injured or the branch that they report to. We're also looking at what was the cause of the accident? Was it a slip and fall or did they cut themselves or maybe um, strain and sprain? And we base everything that we do off of those results. We find that probably 80% of our claims are coming from 15 clients. On those 15 clients, we really focus just on all of our safety programs. And being we're a staffing company, a lot of it is a behavior-based staffing type model for our safety, which I think works for all employers. We're coaching our workers to do safe acts and to perform their job correctly so that they're not going to be injured. And once they do have a claim, the severity is something else that we really watch. We're looking to determine that the associate is getting the correct treatment. They're getting back to work as soon as possible. We want to make sure we're an advocate for them so that the case doesn't go into litigation. Our feeling is that doesn't benefit the injured worker. It doesn't benefit us in most cases. So, Within that severity, we look at our days out of work constantly, and we drill into that to determine why aren't they back to work? Is the injury so severe that they can't do anything? Or is it just a matter of talking to the doctor about a position that we may have that they'd be able to go back to work? Yeah, that's great. Susan has been a frequent speaker and an expert in return to work <laughs> throughout her career. So um, while some employers we really have to work with and hold the hand of around return to work, Susan knows return to work and has created some really phenomenal return to work programs for the employers she's worked at and clients she's had over the years. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Michelle, let's shift over to you. Um, from, from your perspective, you have both operations and you have clients. And so talk to us a little bit about how you decide what to measure and, and talk a little bit about, about your outcome process, if you will. Sure. sure. Um, you know, certainly data is something that we watch all the time across our entire group of, of clients um, for benchmarking and to sort of see what industry trends might be developing. Um, when it comes to individual 
individual employers um, or carriers, really the first thing that we're going to do there is establish good communication to figure out what are they looking at. So Susan, the perfect example, right? She's very clear on the things that are important to her that are going to drive her program forward. So uh, what we will do is really provide the data in support of that. So we, we think about data sort of in two ways. We're looking at making sure that that we as a claim provider are performing to the levels that uh, we expect of ourselves and that our clients expect of us. And then we're looking at program specific data and what we can offer with respect to insights uh, and that data that can help our employer clients uh, decide to, to, to what to do next. Um, I wish everybody was as um, informed and um, had a, such a great understanding of their program as Susan does. I promise you that's not the case. <laughs> and there are certainly um, many times where we're providing some insight that they may not know. Um, so it, it certainly frequency severity, uh, you know, the, I think those are sort of like hallmarks. Um, we're gonna look at those obviously. We're also looking for those trends in those individual locations that might be causing a program to head in the wrong direction. Um, we're looking to see what can we um, offer with respect to recommendations for safety or additional training, all of those things that will help create a lower ultimate cost of risk for the employer. So we look at a lot of different metrics. Mm -hmm. um, we look at way more than we probably ever produce, uh, but really the purpose of that is because we're looking for what are those trending opportunities that can be of most help. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Um, we could take this in so many different directions because it's, it's a big topic, but we've, we've sort of established some of those primary areas that are important to measure. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people thinking, well, you know, what about medical or what about, you know, my particular piece of the claim? And I think one, one thing we have to keep in mind is that the employer is really looking at loss costs and loss costs in a very comprehensive way because the programs they have are complex with many different moving parts. And we'll get deeper into some of the particular areas. Um, but before we do that, Susan, in your position at ADECO and in past positions, who within your company, maybe in the higher ranks or otherwise, are interested in the results, need to know the results, and that you may have responsibility or members on your team to report the results out to? I would say that we're fortunate at ADECO that our executive management is very interested in those results. I do a monthly meeting with our CFO and I really talk through what are all of our new claims that are coming in and what is causing that and what are we going to do about it. In addition, I'll look at pending claims and review that with him. And I'll talk to him about why we're seeing some of the delays or what the impact is on total incurred. And I would say part of our job as risk managers is we really need to market our program within our own organization. So I like to talk about risk whenever I can <laughs> to yeah. for a lesson. But if you get it to the CFOs and the company, it just makes it easier if you're trying to maybe get a budget to, you know, increase something in your program or maybe put a REMIS system into place. If they know that you're measuring results and every investment you make is going to show a return on investment, it's a lot easier. And I frequently talk with top management about our incurs and it, you need to talk to them in their language. So I don't say frequency and severity, but I always talk about this is our cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. I'll give them the work comp cost as a percentage of our overall business cost. 
And one way to do that is we do outline quarterly on our balance sheet, which is produced by our accounting group. We'll outline the work comp cost, everything from the fees we pay, so actuary fees, TPA fees, broker fees, and then our claim cost. So I think if you can get if you can measure that and know what drives the numbers and then build that story for your upper management, it can be really effective. Yeah, I think that's a really good, a good point. And certainly during the pandemic, some risk managers were somewhat elevated in their, their companies because the, the risks associated um, were so heavy and it gave some a tremendous opportunity to have more exposure. And I know a DECO's culture is to have always had awareness, but for risk managers that may be on the um, webinar today or have interest, our employer advisory council at the um, Alliance, along with really engaged risk managers such as Susan have offered to have some small group collaboration specific to building the business case for your C-suite on risk and your risk teams and helping understand the results. Um, but thank you for that, Susan. I'm gonna ask you two questions that I hadn't prepped you for, um, but I know you'll be able to answer these. There will be some people in the audience that don't know what loss costs mean as well as incurred. So do you mind just given your sure. definition? Sure, so incurred is reserves plus paid. So everything you've paid out and the open reserve. And when I'm looking at incurred, I'm also looking at when I close claims, were they within that reserve that we had posted? I think that's a key thing if you, you know, want to be respected by your suite is you want or you're not asking for reserves at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Looking at what does the claim close for within that reserve plus paid? And then loss cost is the cost of your workers' comp as a percentage of your revenue or payroll. So you want to take um, total revenue for your company and then your workers' comp cost and what percentage. And I usually look at that year over year, quarter over quarter, and month over month when I'm talking to our leaders within the company. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you for that. I realize sometimes there's, there's vernacular really important terms that many of us use every day. And a lot of our followers are really trying to understand more comprehensively workers' compensation. So thanks for for explaining that. I'm gonna to flip to you, Michelle. Um, and then uh, once Michelle's done, Susan, I'll have you weigh in on this as well. But Michelle, who are the primary people within your team, whether it's client services or operations, who's responsible for driving the results um, within your organization or your carrier? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, once again, this is a collaborative effort. Right. So from a client service perspective, we're looking to identify those things like I talked about before. Um, that information we provide not only to our employer clients, but if we're seeing something specific, we're going to also engage our claims management team to take a look at what we're seeing um, to determine whether or not there might be something that in a certain jurisdiction could be done differently or handled differently or approached in a different way that ultimately helps um, that helps our clients. Um, and this is also true even in a carrier situation. If we're handling claims directly for an insurance carrier, um, they're looking at many of those same metrics. Uh, same thing there. We'll take that information to their internal claims team or whomever is responsible for overseeing the claims um, that we're handling and make sure that they're also aware of what information we're seeing. And, and again, where we might be able to make some adjustments or changes to the program that ultimately help uh, the ultimate cost of, of those claims. And then do, do you have um, data reporting coming um, from internal? Do you have external sources? How, 
how are you, I mean, you've set that sort of the measurements, but then how do you actually get that data? Who does yeah, that? that? That's a great question. And I should have talked about that first. So, no, so it's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we do have um, an internal data team. Um, and we actually have a couple of different segments within that. Uh, we have folks within that group that are, uh, are truly looking at benchmarking and specific types of um, dashboard data that we can provide to our clients. Uh, we have a group that really focuses on sort of an, uh, more of an annual stewardship type of report, um, which is inevitably much more in depth because those typically will cover sort of a five-year um, period of time, current to mm -hmm. back. Um, we have a number of different systems that have been developed over the years that are, I'm going to call them sort of on demand um, for our, our partnership leaders to be able to go uh, and run those reports in a couple of different ways. Um, some that are, that, are, that are current live um, and others that do more of a trending, uh, uh, um, emerging trending, I'll call it, yeah. uh, quarter over quarter. So yeah. it comes from a, a few different ways. Like I said, um, it's, it's always a bit of a, a, a team effort, right? Um, you need people with different skill sets to be able to, um, to really be able to pull that information out of the system and out of the day-to-day -day, uh, claims that are happening. Yeah, before I have Susan, you talk about um, who's helping you with reporting, internal, external um, partners. I want to also just point out, for those of us, um, that are either in the employer or the payer side, we're faced with, if not daily, certainly multiple times a week where a, a company, a salesperson will come to us and say, I'm going to save you money and I save your competitors money. The programs today are really savvy about the results. Um, and I, when I say programs, that's whether it's a managed care, litigation, um, SIU and the amount of data that payers have and employers have access to probably is much greater than even what you might have in your business. And, you know, just some advice is to know what your value is for that service, but probably don't lead with, I'm going to save you money because you just don't know that. And programs are really complex and it doesn't mean it might not save money, but if you don't know the baseline of where someone is, um, a door can be closed instead of a conversation opened. And so um, I know some of our follow followers have heard me say that before, but really in trying to lift up the industry, there's room for everybody and we all have a you know, the need to learn, um, but just a little bit of advice because our data is super rich um, across all of our, our industry. But Susan, you want to take that question around, you know, driving your results? Sure. So we do um, a quarterly stewardship with our TPA, and that's great to really look at a high level and then drill in to some key areas. And then we also have a few individuals on my team that drill into data and report out to our field. And we take, like to take that data and actually give them actions to take. One example that I think is great to look in your stewardships, I think all of us focus on closure numbers and what's our outstanding pending, but we saw where our numbers kept going down, but our loss reserve, we still felt we had more work to do on that. And really drilling in, we were seeing the medical onlys were closing not it, it very quickly, and we were seeing in a couple areas where we needed to do more on the indemnity, which is the lost time and more difficult claims. So during COVID, we really focused on the age pending and those more difficult claims and brought our attorneys in. And that, um, just really drilling into that and figuring out why they weren't closing was a great way we could partner with our TPA, with our defense counsel. Then we 
made sure that our actuaries were aware of that as well. I think that's always a good thing um, to involve that story and they can help you create the actuary report that really shows the efforts. And then we took all of that data and worked with all of our clients and our branch locations and gave them actions to take based on the trends that we were seeing. So it really mm -hmm. does take like a village to go through this data yeah. and get the actions in place to really get the results. When I first came to work at Sedgwick, um, GE was very well known for their data um, driven results. And I can remember one time with a finger pointed at me um, in a great <laughs> way, but being told, you know, a quarter doesn't make a trend, or a month doesn't make a trend, but a quarter certainly is evident of a trend developing. So mm -hmm. I always think of that in my mind and this need to really understand results frequently. Um, and both Michelle and Susan have mentioned month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year results. But Susan, from an employer perspective, at what point do you take that data and say, now we want to have those action items created? Um, is, is it, you know, quarters? Is it, you know, a blip in a month? How do you determine that? We do that quarterly. We outline in a risk dashboard to all of our operations leaders and our senior management we list every client. For most employers, that would probably be every location. And then we have a dashboard that they can actually click into and see what the actual claims are. So I like to dig as deep as possible. I actually go into like that top 15 and read what was the cause of the accident and mm -hmm. the guidance when we send out this dashboard really saying this is what we're seeing right now causing accidents and here's what you should do. So an example of that during COVID is people start coming back to work. We were seeing younger workers getting injured within the first 30 days that they were back. And we knew that was either deconditioned workers or we weren't training properly. We sent out some different packets of information, what they could do, anything from stretching to proper lifting training for the deconditioned workers. And then um, just followed up with everyone to make sure that was happening and they knew what they should be doing. And I think that changes one quarter, you may see one trend and another quarter, it may be something else. And it's good to build on that training each quarter, mm -hmm. keep your offices involved. Yeah, that's really interesting and a good examples um, that you gave. So when we think about sort of the training that went out, then how are you measuring the results afterwards to see if that training stuck? We would once again look quarter over quarter, did their claims go up? Did they go down? What was the cause of the loss? And then do a reach out to those specific locations to talk through it. Where we see just big problems that we're having a lot of um, losses, we'll send someone on site to go over the data, train on safety, even talk about claims management. Mm -hmm. I think that's helpful. While we understand everything we're measuring, they may, may need a little bit more coaching at the sites to really yeah. understand what to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Michelle, how about at ESIS and in your, your program experience, your client services experience, how frequently are you looking at the, at the results? What might even a dashboard look like? So we, we look at it a number of different ways. I think, you know, what Susan was saying, uh, particularly relevant, um, when we're looking at information quarter over quarter, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We're taking that snapshot each quarter, comparing it to 
um, the one prior. And we go back mm -hmm. five quarters. So we sort of get a little bit more than a year, uh, a year view when we do that. And, and it's exactly that. We're looking at everything from how long did it take to report the claim and what kind of impact did that have um, which, you know, could certainly help with the how well are individual locations managing the claim process. Um, we look at uh, the age of, of workers. We look at how long have they been with the employer company. Um, we're looking for all of those things that might help support why a trend is emerging. Um, that right there, that quarter over quarter is probably what my team spends the most amount of time on, on average. Um, but in addition to that, uh, you know, again, sort of with talking to our risk managers and, and talking to program leaders, um, we're looking at data weekly. Sometimes we're looking at it daily. Um, we're ad hoc reporting on a number of things that are specific to those clients and working through that with them. Um, but I would say probably most frequently, aside from those very specific reports that we do, um, the qu quarter over quarter compare that we look at is huge. And then stewardship. And oftentimes we look at those in tandem. So now we're looking at what's the most recent year telling us about trends that may have emerged. And then how does that compare to the five years prior and what we've seen over that time? Um, and I think when you look at that sort of holistically, right, you're looking at maybe what you're, you're reviewing on a monthly basis or a weekly basis. You're looking at what's happening quarter over quarter and then you're looking at what's happening maybe at a higher level, but for a longer period of time, it gives you a good gauge for the health of the program and some areas that uh, we could recommend for a close look by those employers and how else can we help support them to drive that cost of risk down. And how frequently are stewardships? Sorry, so yes, those, so those are annual. And, and again, are they annual? Okay. Yeah, with, with the intent of a true stewardship being that sort of rear view look um, mm -hmm. over what's happened the last few years um, in our world, uh, that's an annual report versus yeah. our, our quarterly analytic review, um, which obviously happens much more frequently than that. Yeah, that makes sense. What about your program, Susan, in... How free, I mean, I know you're looking at results every month, but from a stewardship perspective, how frequently do you have a stewardship or partnership meetings to go over the, re the results collectively? And then who might be sitting at that table, whether physically or virtually at this point? We do a stewardship quarterly with our TPA and we invite our CFO to that meeting so that he understands the impact of what the TPA is doing, what we're doing at the risk department. We also uh, look at our legal spend and dashboard on a quarterly basis. And we drill down into each of the attorneys. It's amazing what you can find out by looking at that you know, attorneys that are really doing a good job to get a case settled, or maybe attorneys that want to build up their bill, or they settle a case. So I think that's important to look at quarterly. We also meet with our, P, our main PT vendor quarterly to really look at, are we, you know, having the right amount of PT? Are people getting back to work? Or what we would expect? Is it within ODG guidelines? And ODG is official disability guidelines that outline what an injury should expect as far as PP, PT and time out of work. And we feel those couple things are key drivers for us. And that's why we look at that quarterly. Yeah, I think that um, it's really good to bring up the physical therapy. Um, I've certainly sat in stewardships where we had the TPA, the employer's consultant, maybe even the carrier, sometimes the actuary especially if there's been a unique change in the costs, um, and then a variety of managed care 
um, partners. So I'm glad you mentioned the physical therapy mm -hmm. um, because certainly at ADECO, it's, it's expensive. Michelle, do you want to expand on stewardship a little bit? I saw you agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think sometimes... Yeah, you know, vernacular gets in our way. So, um, so we, you know, as Susan was saying, we do meet with our clients quarterly to provide that quarterly partnership review information. Stewardship is just much more involved. And like you said, Kimberly, that can involve, you know, as, as many folks on the risk team for our employers um, as want to participate, typically the CFO, um, uh, vendor partners um, where it makes sense and where we know that there's a specific interest or, or a high, high usage, um, you know, mm -hmm. return to work, physical therapy, all of those things that are really so important in helping to manage uh, the, the claim for the employees um, as well as from a cost perspective. Um, they're pretty lengthy, those meetings. Um, those can mm -hmm. be several hour meetings, but the intent again is to really take a deep dive into what's happened, how does the most current year relate to what's prior? Um, and we, we really like to get from our um, employer partners, what were their goals for the year? I mean, hopefully we already know that, right? Because we've had that discussion <laughs> initially, <laughs> but anytime we have these meetings, we really try to focus the data and the discussions around what were their goals? What were they looking to accomplish in the year? How does the data support what they've done? Um, or how does it give them a perspective that, hey, maybe this didn't go exactly the way we expected, and how can we collectively um, help drive that in the positive direction that they, they need? Yeah, that sounds great. Susan, we've talked about frequency and severity, um, a little bit of return to work. What else might be on a dashboard? Um, you know, looking at quarterly results, some of the other measurements, whether it's legal or medical or durations, what else might be measured? Right. We do spend quite a bit of time on return to work because we feel that if they're back to work, it's going to keep the costs down. They're going to be a lot more likely to return to work fully if we can get them back into work early on. The litigation is always big for us too, especially in like California and New York. I think different jurisdictions, that makes a big impact. This past year, we added a centralized claim unit within um, ADECO to take some of the things that our branches were doing and putting that within the risk department. And part of our goal there was really be more of an advocate and mm -hmm. focused on keeping that litigation spend down. So we're looking at why are our injured workers going into litigation? You know, do they not understand them or is it just an attorney's reaching out to them right away, which happens in some states. Mm -hmm. So drilling into that a little bit more. Um, we look at the medical only versus indemnity. Also, we spend a lot of time on cause of loss because our overall goal is really to avoid the loss in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we feel if we can look at the cause of loss, that gives us a lot of information as to what our strategy needs to be. I think it goes back to that story that I talked about in the beginning. Yeah is I'm always looking for what's our strategy, what should we be talking about, what do we need everybody to be engaged in to really impact the results. And the, the cause of loss tells us a lot mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that. We had a question come in, and Susan, this is going back to when you were talking about reporting out work comp costs in relationship to total revenue. What percentage do you consider optimal? And I understand different businesses have different level of risk, but what do you consider optimal and what percentage do you utilize as your benchmark? I always aim for a 1.0%. Um, and that's really aggressive 
but we measure that on frequency. So the frequency of losses as your percentage of revenue, and then also your severity as a percentage of revenue. Work comp can be such a big cost for so many companies. So I think trying to push that to a 1% and believe me, you can get there. It took us several years to push ours to that point. But I think just each year having the new initiative that's going to help you get there, it's very doable. And then for employers, we also have an experience mod rating and a 1.0 there as well. Is means you're really doing a good job, and that's the goal. You're doing as well as every other employee employer out there. If you can get it below that, even better. Yeah, no, that's really, really great. There's another question, and I think this too is geared um, towards an employer. In monitoring the loss cost, is there a number or percentage you want to stay within or do you measure your results against yourself year over year? With the experience mod, you're measuring yourself against other employers. I also ask our TPA to benchmark us against book of business, so temporary staffing. We also benchmark against retail because we do a lot of work in distribution centers, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's a good idea to benchmark with your TPA, with like businesses, even with mm -hmm. your worker. But I still say that measuring yourself against yourself each, mm -hmm. year, each quarter, mm -hmm. thing that I try to do, I'm going to call it an impact report. But I give this to our CFO at the end of every year. How do we measure year over year? And I usually look at five years. And then what I call it an impact report. What did my team do to really impact those numbers? Mm -hmm. And just everything. I just did that um, recently for the past five years. And when you really sit back and look at it, you're like, wow, all these different things went into play. Uh, that's why I say do it annually, just so you don't forget all of the yeah. things that your team has worked on. And team meaning, you know, everybody within your company and your insurance carrier, TPA, any safety help you may get, I think it all plays into those results that you're measuring. Yeah, I think, um, Michelle, we can understand that as well as servicing employers. Um, really important, we remember everything we did and not just to say, hey, you know, we did this for you, but really the collective, the partnership, mm -hmm. you know, and what did we put in place um, to help drive those results. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. Well, so, um, if I can second what Susan was saying about benchmarking and who do you benchmark against, and you know how much value can that bring, um, we field a lot of questions about that. About how are we doing compared to others? And, and really, Susan, what you said was so true. So, benchmarking against others in a similar industry is always interesting. It's going to give you some insights as to how you know, how the industry may be performing and, and, and how you sort of fit within that. But really, you know, even think about the, the temp staffing space, right? Every single company that, 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 that operates in that space has a different model, different types of, of mm -hmm. uh, companies that they're working with, um, different needs that they're fulfilling. So it gives you an idea um, but really the truest thing to measure is, is against yourself. How are you improving year over year, what you're doing and, and how can you continue to do that? Yeah. And then knowing that baseline, um, mm -hmm. I always, you know, you never want to tell a client that their baby's ugly, meaning their results <laughs> are what they think they are, but improving year over year on your own, own results are great, but always having an idea of a benchmark. If you're, you know, significantly above everybody else in a particular geography, for instance, or a particular type of claim with frequency and causation. Always good to know that. But 
you've got to be able to improve your own your own results. And it sounds like just to go back to the question specifically, there's not necessarily a percentage you would look for, but more of assessing that opportunity and then what might that goal be. Is that accurate, Susan? Right. And I would say, like I typically I'll say I want to reduce my frequency by 5% this year. Okay. But before I pick that number, I'm really looking at how am I going to do that? I don't want to just, you know, take a number out of the air, but I would maybe look at, I have these 10 locations that if I can just fix this, that'll get me to the 5% or I mm -hmm. see an opportunity in my claim data. It's going to be different for everyone. <laughs> And I think you need to know what your plan is before you commit or you'll end up at the end of the year not being able to meet your goals. Yeah, really, really good point. We have another question. And thanks so much for the questions. Um, this question is understanding point of contact within an employer. So we think of risk managers and claims managers and safety and we've talked at the Alliance that are in a variety of ways that know who your audience is, know the role of the person you're speaking with, um, because that might not be the person that really can assist you. So, Susan, from your perspective, whether it's a DECO or others, who are the people within an organization, maybe even titles around risk, safety, claims? Yes. I would start with your CEO and making sure that they understand you need to be on the front end to have an impact. And that can be a challenge. A lot of times risk departments are sort of just a back office. But if you have those conversations with the CEO, the operating officer, the CFO, and how you can help them. I think that's important. We at ADECO even tried to really make sure our allocation or chargeback program to the field where we were charging out our losses was gonna be impactful enough to get us in the conversation early on when we were working with new clients or setting goals for the year. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be your everyday operational people that are working closely with your workers. Mm -hmm. There's going to be key people that can help you really get your goals done and, you know, put the things into place. And I think that's where you're going to spend a lot of time with discussions of why it's helpful and how it fits into the culture and how it helps them be able to sell. When I'm trying to talk to like our day-to-day -day people, I really talk about how it can, you know, the work comp costs can have an impact on your pricing or in this day and age, it's so hard to even find workers that you don't yeah. make, have people get injured. Let's make sure, you know, they come back every day and they're not injured. I would say that conversation constantly changes based on what's going on in the yeah. place. Yeah, and I'm not sure who asked the question, but I would just add, um, if you're a service provider and you're looking to be able to connect with one of those individuals, I would just be thoughtful about asking, who's responsible for safety in your organization? Because what you might find is it's regional, it might be, and, and Michelle happens to be married to a safety expert. <laughs> so you may have a better response here, but you know, there might be um, somebody at the employer responsible for all safety. It could be in specific geographies or warehouses. It could even be that the consultant, maybe the broker has the loss control um, business for an employer or at least supports it. So that's an example. Um, sometimes the carriers, in a, in a, especially in a bundled program, mm -hmm. there may be X amount of hours of safety included. And I think that in a lot of the programs you'll find in U.S. work comp programs, there is a risk manager or insurance buyer. Sometimes that's the same. Sometimes it's not. 
and then a claims manager or managers that um, are within the risk department oftentimes. Sometimes those are even separate, but but um, it's often nice when they are together that then mm -hmm. the claims managers may have certain pieces of the business as well. Um, we're down and to- Kimberly, maybe um, procurement also. You oh, just, yeah. Procurement departments within a company know who's responsible for each aspect yeah. of the program. That's yeah. a good point. And so many, so many times now procurement runs um, RFPs and engagement with partners. Mm -hmm. Michelle, final thoughts? We've got three minutes. Hey, you know, I was just going to say sort of um, in relation to that too, it's a tough question to answer because every organization is going to be different as far as um, who's responsible for claims or who's responsible for safety. Is it the same person? Is it different people? Like Kimberly said, is it regional? Is it, you do have to ask the questions and try to get a good understanding of the business and, and I kind of go back to what I said at the very beginning. One of the most important things that we can ever do is really have that deep contact and communication with our clients so that we know not only what their goals are, but who are the people that are going to be responsible for making changes should they need to occur and who can we best assist with the information that we can provide um, given all of the data that we're, we're housing on, on these programs. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for that. Susan, mm -hmm. final thoughts? I think just to sort of go off of what Michelle said, I've sat on the employer side and the TPA side, that understanding the program and the services that make sense to sell is so key because you want to be able to offer what makes sense for the goals that the employer is trying to achieve. And yeah. From the employer side, the big thing is just always understanding what's going on in that particular year. Like last year during COVID, I really did not try to take any credit for reducing frequency because it was just really, you know, people weren't working and trying to change the story more to we're working with our TPA on reducing age pending. This will put us in a better position as um, business comes back. So I think we need to be careful with that discussion as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you on behalf of the Alliance, Michelle and Susan, for joining us today. And thank you to all of our attendees for participating. Share information on the Alliance. Invite someone to join us. And we sure hope to see you soon in either one of our virtual events or our upcoming The Happiness Effect at WCI in December. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.